I could fly higher than any gull. You are the wind beneath my wings. Hi, and welcome once again to Tom's Hit Parade. It is time for November Backtracks. Can you believe that? It's November already. Where has the year gone? Did it go out my window? I, and I've been doing this channel for almost a year now. I, I, it's hard to believe, and 2019 is almost here. What can I say? But anyway, as I said, it is time for Backtracks, my monthly roundup of notable artist birthdays and album anniversaries, divisible by five. Do the math. So anyway, let's get started with the birthdays this month. Uh, this would have been the 185th birthday month of Russian composer Alexander Borodin, who was actually a doctor and chemist by profession. Uh, this would also be the 150th birthday month of ragtime composer Scott Joplin, responsible for The Entertainer and Maple Leaf Rag, among many others. A happy 145th birthday wishes this month go out to the late W.C. Handy, who is widely considered to be the father of the blues. He composed the song Memphis Blues, which is regarded to be the first blues song ever. Happy 90th birthday to C.W. McCall, country singer uh, most notable for the, uh, the song Convoy. 85th November birthday wishes go out this month to the late film composer John Barry, uh, most notable for his scores to the James Bond films, as well as one of my childhood favorites, the Disney film The Black Hole. Uh, this month would be the 80th birthday of electronic musician Miko, uh, who is best known for his disco-flavored renditions of films from sci-fi classics such as Star Wars, Close Encounters, and Superman. Happy 75th birthday this month to folk rock singer Joni Mitchell. Uh, 70th birthday wishes this month go out to the late Glenn Frey, founding member of the Eagles. Uh, turning 65 this month is Andy Partridge, men member of the rock band XTC. Uh, happy 60th birthday this November to 80s pop singer Stacy Q, uh, famous for her single Two of Hearts. Happy 55th birthday this month to Canadian jazz singer Holly Cole. Uh, turning 50 this month is rapper Old Dirty Bastard, member of the Wu-Tang Clan. Happy 45th birthday this November to Nick Lachey, pop solo singer and member of the boy band 98 Degrees. Happy 40th birthday this month to American Idol runner-up Clay Aiken. And 35th birthday wishes this month go out to pop rock singer Tyler Hilton. No relation to Paris Hilton. And now on with the album anniversaries. 55 years ago this month, Johnny Mathis released his 17th album, Romantically. It was his last album for Columbia until he returned to the label in 1967. It spent 27 weeks on the Billboard Albums chart, peaking at number 23. It featured the Rodgers and Hammerstein songs Getting to Know You from The King and I, and The Sound of Music, as well as his renditions of It's Only a Paper Moon and Moonlight in Vermont. Also released in November of 1963 was the Beatles' sophomore album, With the Beatles, which was actually the first album in North America under the title Beatlemania with the Beatles. Uh, by September of 1965, it had become the second album to sell one million copies in the UK after the South Pacific soundtrack. It featured their renditions of Chuck Berry's Roll Over Beethoven and Smokey Robinson's You Really Got a Hold on Me, as well as the songs All My Loving, I Want to Be Your Man, and All I've Got to Do. Half a century ago, The Kinks released their sixth album, The Kinks Are the Village Green Preservation Society. It was the last album to feature bassist Pete Quaife, and despite unanimous critical praise and its eventual reputation, it failed to chart originally, uh, but it is ranked number 255 on Rolling Stone's Greatest Albums of All Time list. It featured the songs Starstruck, Picture Book, and the title track. Also released in November of 1968 was Love Child, the 15th album by Diana Ross and the Supremes. It was their first studio album without songs written or produced by the team of Holland Dozier Holland. It peaked at number 14 on the Billboard 200 charts and number 13 on the UK albums chart. It featured the song Some Things You Never Get Used To, written by Ashford and Simpson, as well as the number one hit title track, which dethroned the Beatles' Hey Jude after its nine-week run at number one. In November of 1973, Daryl Hall and John Oates released their sophomore album, Abandoned Luncheonette. 
It was the most successful of their three albums for Atlantic Records, and it was actually also the duo's personal favorite album. It was produced by Arif Mardin. It peaked at number 33 on the Billboard charts and was certified platinum 29 years after release. It featured their single, She's Gone. And as a trivia note, uh, the album cover of the discarded Rosedale Diner building dumped along Route 724 in Pennsylvania was shot by Barbara Wilson, and that was her only ever album cover shoot. Also released 45 years ago this month was Wovoka, the fifth album by Native American band Redbone. It included a track called We Were All Wounded at Wounded Knee, which was kept off the U.S. and Canadian release due to its controversial content, although it was left on the album in Europe, where its uh, controversial context was, of course, greatly diminished. But anyway, it also bore the band's most popular single, Come and Get Your Love, which spent 18 weeks in the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100, peaking at number 5, and was the fourth most popular song of 1974. Forty years ago this month, Rod Stewart released his ninth album, Blondes Have More Fun. It was his first venture into the disco genre. It hit number one in the U.S., Sweden, Australia, and New Zealand, and went top ten in five other countries. It featured his number one single, Do You Think I'm Sexy?, as well as the singles Ain't Love a Bitch, the title track, and his cover of the four tops hit, Standing in the Shadows of Love. Also released in November of 1978 was Jazz, the seventh album by British rock band Queen. It reached number two on the UK Albums Chart and number six on the Billboard 200. It featured the singles Don't Stop Me Now, Bicycle Race, and Fat Bottom Girls, as well as the multilingual track Mustafa. 35 years ago this month, Duran Duran released their third album, Seven and the Ragged Tiger. It was their last album with the original band lineup for 21 years until 2004's Astronaut. It was their first and only UK number one album. It peaked at number eight in the US and was certified platinum two months after release. It featured the singles Union of the Snake and New Moon on Monday, both of which went top 10 in the UK and the US, as well as The Reflex, which went number one in both countries. Also released in November of 1983 was Billy Idol's sophomore album Rebel Yell. It peaked at number six in the US, where it eventually went double platinum, and it went top 10 in Canada, New Zealand, and Germany. It featured the singles Rebel Yell, Eyes Without a Face, and Flesh for Fantasy. And as a trivia note, Billy Idol got the name for the album from a party he attended with the Rolling Stones where they were drinking a brand of bourbon named Rebel Yell. November of 1988 saw the release of the soundtrack from the Oscar-nominated movie Beaches. It was the best-selling album of Bette Midler's career. It peaked at number two on the Billboard 200 charts and in Australia. All of its songs but one feature vocals by Midler. It includes a cover of Under the Boardwalk, as well as songs by Cole Porter and Randy Newman, and, of course, the smash hit single Wind Beneath My Wings, which went number one in the U.S. and Australia and top ten in several other countries. It was nominated for Grammys for Record of the Year and Song of the Year. But actually, it wasn't a Bette Midler original song. It was recorded in the previous five years by artists such as Sheena Easton, Lou Rawls, and Gladys Knight. Also released three decades ago this month was Harry Connick Jr.'s sophomore album, 20. It was his first album with vocals, it reached number 6 on the Jazz Albums Chart and number 133 on the Billboard 200. It featured appearances by Dr. John and Carmen McRae, and featured his renditions of the songs Swonderful, Do You Know What It Means to Miss New Orleans, If I Only Had a Brain, and Blue Skies. A quarter of a century ago, Ace of Bass released their album The Sign. It was their debut for North America and Japan, but it was actually a modified version of their European album Happy Nation, which was released earlier. It stayed in the top three of the Billboard 200 charts for 26 consecutive weeks, and it currently ranks among the top 100 best-selling albums of all time in the U.S. It received a Grammy nomination for Best Pop Album, and contained the singles All That She Wants, The Sign, and Don't Turn Around, all of which went number one in Canada and top five in the U.K. and the U.S. Also released in November of 1993 was Elton John's first duets album, Duets. It debuted at number 7 in the UK, spent 22 weeks on the US charts, peaking at number 25. It featured the number one smash hit duet with George Michael, a re-recording of Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me, as well as Don't Go Breaking My Heart with RuPaul, Teardrops with Katie Lang, and Shaky Ground with Don Henley. Happy 20th anniversary to Whitney Houston's fourth album, My Love Is Your Love. It was her first studio album in eight years, if you don't count the soundtracks to The Bodyguard and The Preacher's Wife and it scored her her sixth Grammy Award for Best R&B Performance, as well as six other nominations, including Best R&B Album. It peaked at number 13 on the Billboard 200 charts, 
hit number one in Australia, Netherlands, and Switzerland, and it went top ten in ten other European countries. It featured the singles When You Believe, which won the Oscar for Best Song for a Film for the movie Prince of Egypt, as well as Heartbreak Hotel, It's Not Right But It's Okay, and the title track, which was her third best-selling single. Also released that same month was Jewel's sophomore album Spirit. Its guest musicians included Josh Clayton Felt, Jude Cole, and Flea. It reached number three on the Billboard 200 charts and went four times platinum, and it also went top ten in Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. It featured the, sit the hit single Hands, which went number six in the U.S., number one in Canada, and top ten in Jerusalem and Japan, interestingly enough. It also featured the songs Down So Long and Jupiter. November of 2003 saw the release of Blink-182's self-titled fifth album. It peaked at number three on the Billboard 200 charts and was certified platinum the following year. It went number one in Canada and top ten in Australia and New Zealand. It featured the hit single All of This, which was a collaboration with The Cure's Robert Smith, as well as hit singles Feeling This and I Miss You. Also released in November of 2003 was Sarah McLaughlin's fifth album Afterglow. It was her first album in six years. It was produced by Pierre Marchand and featured Bare Naked Ladies' Jim Cregan on, on acoustic bass. It peaked at number two on the Billboard 200 charts and went double platinum and reached number one in Canada. It received five Juno nominations, those are the Canadian Grammys, including Album of the Year. It also received a U.S. Grammy nom nomination for Pop Vocal Album. Its singles included Stupid, World on Fire, and the top 40 hit, Fallen. Ten years ago this month, electro-rock band Shiny Toy Guns released their sophomore album, Season of Poison. It reached number 47 on the Billboard 200 charts and included the singles Ricochet and Ghost Town. Now, this album is darker than their first album, uh, which I cannot remember the name of off the top of my hand. But if you like, it's almost like grungy electropop, if you can think of such a thing, or grungy electro rock. Uh, it, it's very different. Uh, give it a try if you're not afraid to uh, try listening to anything. Uh, Shiny Toy Gun, Season of Poison. Good album. Also released in November of 2008 were the self-titled albums by David Archuleta and David Cook, the runner-up and winner, respectively, of American Idol's seventh season. Uh, they were released one week apart from each other, and David Cook's uh, album was certified platinum a week before David Archuleta's was certified gold. Uh, and honestly, this was the first season that I watched American Idol, and I was honestly rooting for both probably David Archuleta, uh, Archuleta a little bit more than David Cook, but they were both excellent, and uh, yeah my first season of American Idol. Hard to believe somebody who loves music like I do waited six seasons to start watching American Idol, but there you go. But uh, yeah, I enjoyed it, and uh, I've been enjoying a lot of the music since then. I'll probably do an American Idol episode at some point soon. November of 2013 saw the release of singer-songwriter Jake Bugg's sophomore album, Shangri-La. It was produced by Rick Rubin and named after Rubin's recording studio in Malibu, California. It only peaked at number 46 on the Billboard 200 charts, but it reached the top 10 in the UK, Ireland, and Scotland. It featured the singles What Doesn't Kill You, Slumville Sunrise, and my personal favorite, Me and You. Also released five years ago this month was Robbie Williams' album Swings Both Ways. It reached number one in the, its debut week to become the UK's 1,000th number one album. And it was also Robbie Williams' 11th album to hit number one, which tied him for second place with Elvis Presley for the most UK number one albums. This album featured appearances by Rufus Wainwright, Lily Allen, Kelly Clarkson, and Michael Bublé, and featured the singles Go Gentle, Shine My Shoes, and, as you know, is a personal favorite of mine, Dream a Little Dream. And now it is time for the Spotlight albums, and yes, for the first time since I think it's been May or June, uh, I actually have two Spotlight albums this month. Uh, that's actually going to be a New Year's resolution for me for next year. I'm going to have more two album spotlight album months on Backtracks. Uh, so the first album, and uh, Sam Bennett, you're going to be proud of me for this one. Uh, this album is 45 years ago th this month. It is the fourth album by progressive rock band Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. It is Brain Salad Surgery. Now, I have to be, uh, if you've listened to Sam Bennett's podcast, which featured me, uh, I, I really have to be in the mood for prog rock. I'm not, I'm not a prog rock fan, really, at all. But, uh, you know, his... his uh, pestering me about it uh, in the best way possible has uh, convinced me to try dipping my toes a little bit more into Prague, and I've got to say this is 
this is a very promising start. I really, really enjoyed this album. Uh, it, it's a little odd, it's a little different, like most prog is, uh, but honestly, if all of ELP's albums are like this, um, I'm going to have a lot of fun. And actually, I do have... Uh, my sister left me in her collection. I do have works by Emerson Lake Palmer on CD. So uh, I did, did listen to that one months ago, and it was interesting. But yeah, this one, for some reason, this one really kind of captivated me. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, side one, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a few, you know, singles, you know, a few separate songs, and then the first section of a suite which carries all the way throughout side two called Carn Evil Nine. The, the names, I mean, there you go. That's one thing with prog rock is, you know, the names and of the songs and arrangements and stuff can sometimes be very, very obscure. Uh, but yeah, uh, I like the I liked side one. Uh, Jerus Jerusalem was good. I liked Toccata for some reason. That, that that's an, an arrangement of a classical piece. And honestly, one of the big things that I like about ELP is the organs and the uh, the Moog synthesizers. They use some of that as well as the harpsichord. I I don't know what it is about the harpsichord that I liked at least in in the context of this music. Very, very good. And uh, and even uh, Carnival 9, th the entire suite, a lot of different moods and textures in that. There was one that kind of approached a, uh, what do I want to say, it was a calypso thing, or you know, some kind of you know tropical sort of a, a mood. And you know, and then there was you know other parts of it that were quite different. I've only listened to this album a couple of times. I, I, I definitely, definitely need to listen to it more. And uh, I am seriously considering uh, not stopping here with ELP. So, excellent album. The only song that I really did not care for is Benny the Bouncer. And here, strangely enough, that is the most conventional pop-sounding song on the record. And it was my least favorite. So, hey, I guess that means my tastes are changing, right? I don't know. But uh, anyway, yeah. A very, very good album. If you have not listened to this uh, and you're in the mood to be a little adventurous with your listening, Definitely try this. Brain Salad Surgery by Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. One of the most memorable uh, Backtracks albums I've uh, listened to lately. So uh, thank you in part to Sam Bennett for uh, nudging me in that direction. Okay, now the second Spotlight album this month is a little closer to traditional pop rock, although it is, so, uh, it is a little bit different. Uh, it is 50 years old this month. It is the sophomore album by Van Morrison, Astral Weeks. Now the uh, the clerk that I bought this from warned me that it it's one that needs needs repeated listens to really sink in, and it it will definitely get repeated listens. Now I've I, I kind of like Van Morrison. I've got I think I counted seven uh, CDs by him. Uh, this is the first LP that I bought of his. Uh, like three or four of the CDs came from my sister's collection, and the rest I bought on my own. Uh, so I, I'm I'm really getting to like Van Morrison. And uh, yeah, this this is a very interesting album. It's it, it reminds me a lot of uh, I think this guy came out after Van Morrison, uh, Nick Drake, very kind of moody and uh, you know one of those artists that as I said at least with this album, uh, you can't you can't get into it on the first listen. You cannot expect to, or maybe even on the second. So that's one thing that I'm going to be kind of interested in is to look back at this video months down the line or a year or two down the line after I've listened to this album a few more times, just to uh, compare how I feel about it at that point to how I feel about it now. But yeah, it was a very interesting listen. I'm glad I picked it up, uh, But I, and I think it will grow on me. I mean, there's there's something about Van Morrison's voice in his early recordings. It's just it's just definitely Van Morrison. You know it is. And uh, But yeah, I can't think of any songs off the bat. Uh, I mean, I've only listened to this once. I kind of uh, fell behind, and uh, I, I wanted to get this video out to you, so yeah, I only listened to it once, But uh, so this is just a first impression, but uh, it's a good first impression, I think. Uh, I think this album will only grow on me, as I said. So yeah, I cannot think of any tracks off uh, the top of my head that uh, were really stick out in memory, but uh, yeah, it's a good album. Uh, so yeah, my, my favorite of the two is definitely ELP. Uh, so as I said, thank you to Sam Bennett for uh, helping me to uh, dip a little bit more into Prague. Uh, which I'm going to keep on doing, uh, especially if this is representative of, of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer's re the rest of their stuff, I'm definitely di dipping more into them. So anyway, that is it for Backtracks for November, the next to last Backtracks of the year, if you can believe that. Uh, thank you very much for, for watching. Um, what are your favorite November anniversary albums? Let me know in the comments, and uh, 
please subscribe if you have not subscribed yet. I would love to have you as a subscriber. So yeah, thank you so much for watching. Uh, see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.